Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 22nd, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as by streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour Tuesday show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we provide our take on the primary election results thus far. Second, we explain why the decision by Santos and Repsol to sanction, industry lingo for take the final investment decision on, phase one of the PICA project is very good news for Alaska from a number of perspectives. And third, we explain where we differ from the Department of Revenue on its oil price outlook and why we aren't as concerned as others about DOR's most recent state revenue update. And now let's join Michael. It is the Tuesday, the deep dive. Brad Keithley from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets joins us, and we're ready to get into the weekly top three, which includes today the results of the primary, the new oil uh, announcements, and the surplus and the deficit that we were just talking about, which uh, I have to madly cackle about when I realize that the governor foresaw some of this stuff and moved some of that money into the CBR. Uh, but Brad joins us this morning to discuss this and more. Good morning, my friend. How are you doing? Michael, I'm doing great today. How about you? You know, it's a, I'm, it's, I'm above ground. That's a good day. Any day above ground is a good day. Um, so, uh, so let's get started. Um, you, you and I really haven't talked much since, uh, since the primary and, um, you know, uh, we've been talking about it as a, uh, you know, kind of a bellwether, kind of a poll more than anything else, but it's not even really that, but it is kind of a snapshot of kind of where people are at. I don't want to ascribe too much to it, especially in the state legislature, uh, legislative races. Uh, but I want you to give us your full rundown from top to bottom, what you think uh, of uh, of everything that happened uh, last Tuesday. Well, I think I think it's important for this purpose. Money will flow to those races that show in the that showed in the primary that they're they're competitive. Uh, it will flow to uh, incumbents to protect them. It will flow to challengers uh, who have a chance at getting at incumbents. Uh, and I think I think it's important from a money and a support standpoint. I think it sort of will have the effect of thinning out the herd uh, to a degree on uh, on what people are doing. So, um, yeah, it's not. I mean, you don't declare winners and losers off of off of uh, off of this vote, um, but you you do begin to see trends, or you do begin to see possibilities, maybe that. Uh, that, that you hadn't seen before or confirms possibilities you hadn't seen before. In the governor's race, I want to focus on the state races today. In the governor's race, uh, I think it's good news. Uh, Dunleavy finished uh, uh, far out in front. Less and, and, uh, and uh, Walker uh, uh, essentially tied for, uh, for second place. Um, and Charlie Pierce, which we have talked about a lot on the show over the weeks running up to the election, uh, Charlie Pierce finished fourth, which I thought was a was a is a very good thing, uh, right? Right. When you start when you start considering when we get into rank choice, uh, second choice ballots, uh, second choice votes on the on on Charlie Pierce, I think are going to be critical when we get down to the final final election. And I and there's nothing in the primary that changed my mind uh, about that. I think Dunleavy is going to be dependent on those second choice ballots uh, from Charlie Pierce when we when we get into the final. I don't think he's I don't think he's positioned to to win a clear. Fifty uh, percent on first ballot, so it's going to take second ballot, and I think Charlie's Charlie's a good candidate. I would say 
in addition to that, I was I was uh, pleasantly surprised how well Charlie did. 10% of the vote so far, uh, more votes to come in, certainly, uh, but 10% of the votes so far. That's a third of, uh, of Walker. It's a third of Guerra. Um, that for a guy who, you know, comes off the Kenai Peninsula with not a whole lot of statewide uh, recognition. So I, I'm, I'm pleased uh, by, the, by the governor's race. I think money will continue to flow uh, to Dunleavy. Um, and I think there's going to be some money coming to Charlie uh, as a result of his showing uh, in the campaign. And isn't, that, isn't that a bit of a David and Goliath thing, though, when you talk about money? I mean, Dunleavy is, I mean, we were talking about into the hundreds of thousands, close to a million bucks. And Charlie, I think the last reporting that I saw on him was that he was like 60 or $70,000. I mean, this is a David and Goliath race. It is, but it, but it's, it's, it's enough to keep what, what I think I'm thinking about in this situation is enough to keep Charlie going, uh, to keep getting the message out, uh, to, uh, to, 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 Put some additional signs up to get some broader uh, uh, media, maybe beyond uh, beyond just the Kenai Peninsula. So it's not it's not going to overtake Dunleavy. It's not even going to overtake Walker uh, in terms of in terms of money out there. But it's going to keep Charlie going, and I think uh, I think that's I, I think frankly that's the advantage of the Dunleavy campaign to keep Charlie going uh, strong, um, and and I think it's to the advantage of Charlie to. Or, to, to the issues that you and I talk about on the show to keep Charlie going strong. So I, I, I expect some money, not, I mean, not millions and millions of dollars, but I expect some money to, to kick to Charlie as a, as a result of, of his showing. So that's the good news. The, the bad news uh, I think is the Senate and the results in the Senate. I mean, we, we've talked a lot about on the show about the need to, to get at the incumbents, incumbents, uh, uh, to, to, you know, hopefully have some insurgent candidates, uh, uh, replace the incumbents like Roger Holland did with, uh, Kathy Giesel and like, uh, Bob, uh, Rob Myers did with, uh, uh, with John Coghill, um, in the, in the Senate. And, and that's, you know, sort of what we, what we, what we've hoped for. It's the reverse. Um, Click Bishop, um, has a big lead again. It's the primary again. It's right, not, right. you know. Right. We're not talking about the final votes, but uh, but Click Bishop has a big lead uh, in uh, in his race against his challenger. I think surprisingly, Gary Stevens has a big lead uh, in in the race against his challenger. And again, it's not that I'm not suggesting it's the final vote, but I am suggesting that when people are looking where to put money um, uh, behind behind candidates, um, it's going to be tough to 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 make a case for. Uh, to make a case for the challengers to click into and to Gary as a result. Because people uh, want to back a winner. I mean, when you've yeah. got a significant advantage, like a 20 or 30 point lead, you're much more likely to receive those monies. If it's a tight race, then it may be a toss up as to who gets the money. But it's a, if it's an obvious leader, then the money is more likely to flow to the person who is likely to win because people want to be part of a, you know, they want to, they want to back a winner. Well, yeah. And they want, they want that influence. They want that. They want the ability to, to get their calls answered when uh, when the election's over, so that's why they're looking for for winners. Good luck. With, um, good luck with the, click on that, from what I understand. I'm sorry. I said good luck with click on that, from what I understand. <laughs> yeah, well, and Stevens. I mean, not, Stevens is is tough to get a hold hey, of he, too. But. He campaigned hard, Brad. That's what he said. He, he campaigned hard. That's, that's uh, what he, I heard. That's that's what I heard you say. Yeah, uh, I'm not quite I'm not quite sure what Gary's definition of campaign hard you're is. Using but that's that what word. I heard you say. Keep using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I think another disappointing one to me was the was the Merrick McCarty race. Uh, I had hoped that Ken was going to be a lot closer to Kelly Merrick uh, in the Eagle River District uh, than, uh, than than the numbers are looking like right now. Um, that district is odd. I mean, that was Anna McKinnon's district, plus or minus. That was Anna McKinnon's district, and then it went to Laura Reinbold. So it went from moderate R to to conservative are, um, and you know, Anna didn't run again, I think because of concern about Laura's challenge in the primary. Now it looks like it's flipping back to very moderate art. It looks like it's flipping back toward the, toward the McKinnon side. So our, I don't, yeah. I, 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 I need to dig into the numbers more in that race, but I gotta say, I was disappointed uh, about the, uh, about well, the I, that race. you know, I wonder how much again, um, you know, this is a primary and special interests, uh, 
uh, generally show up very well in a primary. There's a huge amount of uh, there's a huge amount of union support, obviously, for Merrick. Um, and they're a motivated group of special interests. So, well, I mean, I thought she may do well, you're, but you're right. It was very surprising to me. And McCarty is, you know, I mean, he's, he's, I've had him on the show one time and the response was, well, I don't really like to be on the, on the, well, you gotta be, I mean, this is part of it. You gotta go out there and get it done. So, um, I'm hoping that there can be some changes there because I, you know, she's censured by her own party in that district. She really made some people angry. I don't know if it's just because people were apathetic or if the special interests ruled the day. Well, it shows, it shows at least at, at, at a minimum, it shows that McCarty has a lot more work to do. I mean, yes, this isn't, these aren't the final numbers. Yes, there may be, you know, uh, certainly additional people that come out in the general, but McCarty has a lot to work, a, a lot of work to do. You can't, you can't spin those numbers any way other than he has a lot of work to do. And, and he likely has work to do in, in terms of fundraising to the extent fundraising is important in that district. He likely has work to do in terms of shoe leather to get out in the district. Uh, and he uh, likely has uh, uh, work to do in terms of publicity. So, you know, if he doesn't like to come on the show, that's, uh, that's, not, that's not a good sign. Um, and then we have the two big disappointments, I think, on the Senate side, uh, Shower and Roger Holland. I know, again, we're not talking about final results. Again, we're talking about only, you know, primary. We're talking about people who, you know, showed up for a primary, didn't show up for the final. Uh, but you would have, I would have hoped for, you know, clip, click Bishop, Gary Stevens type numbers against their insurgents. Uh, uh, so showing up in the in the shower race against uh, Doug Massey and showing up in the Holland race against uh, against Kathy Giesel. I was hoping for big numbers that uh, that showed those weren't uh, weren't going to be competitive races. So the money stayed out of those races. So you know the incumbents uh, uh, in those races continue to have uh, continue to have a, 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 a sort of a glide path to victory. I think what what we see now is money's going to show up in those races. Uh, it's going to show up because Massey had a good showing and because uh, uh, Giesel had a good showing. I think we're going to see money show up in those races in support of the uh, challengers. Yeah. And hopefully money will show up in support of the money and effort and, and, and support uh, indications of support will show up in support of the, uh, the uh, 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 incumbents as well. But rather than, rather than, you know, channeling money now and channeling effort, to the challengers, to, to to Click and to Gary Stevens, that money and that effort is going to need to go to support uh, uh, Shower and uh, and Holland, right? And uh, and and continue pushing them. So it's a, I think the Senate, the governor's race is good. I think the Senate is just a very bad, uh, from the standpoint of the PFD, from the standpoint of uh, fiscal conservatism. I think the the Senate uh, results are. Are, are not good and, uh, and, and almost to the point of being bad. Uh, how about the house races uh, we, uh, we're, we're going to take a little longer on this than I think we anticipated, but what about the house races? Because I think we saw some positivity coming in there, but again, if we take the house back and are able to form a conservative majority in the house and we lose the Senate to some kind of bipartisan, we're, we're right, we're right back into the gridlock that we were before. So w what's your take on the house? I think the house was okay. Uh, uh, Kathy Hensley's, uh, uh, showing against Andy Josephson, I think is a, is a strong point. Uh, uh Tom McKay's, uh, showing against Denny Wells, uh, Forrest Wolf's, uh, showing ag against Donna Mears. I think those are all positives. I don't know if they're, I don't know if, if that taking the house back translates into the positive PFD position that, that you and I, uh, talk about on the show. Uh, I think it may be more middle of the road Republican. I mean, you got Will Stapp up in up in Fairbanks to replace uh, Steve Thompson. Looks on track to replace Steve Thompson, but that's not much of an improvement from a from a from a PFD standpoint. Right. So, that, taking the House back for the Republicans looks possible, but I'm not sure it's a strong take it back and 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 get the PFD protected uh, 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 outcome uh, that that we're seeing there yet. Final thoughts here on the overall primary. Again, just a preliminary, just a snapshot, just a poll, nothing set in stone, but your final thoughts on uh, on, uh, on the, on the uh, primary as a whole. A lot of work to do on the Senate. Uh, uh, 
the focus, I think, Governor's race is in good shape, plus or minus. Charlie's in good shape. It's good to see him uh, in the final four. Uh, but a lot of work to do on the Senate. And I think that's where the, uh, for my focus, and I think that's where the focus of people who are certainly concerned about the PFD uh, needs to be uh, in the coming days. You know, we had shower on last week, Brad, and um, after the uh, the day after the election, and he gave us some interesting analysis. You know, part of it, if you look at how his district is drawn, his district is drawn. First of all, I was shocked. He was my senator. I didn't even know that in the redistricting. I hadn't even seen that they had reached down on KGB, Canicus Bay Road, and scooped up a bunch of people out of there. Um, I didn't even realize it until I got to the polls. That's how, I mean, odd it was. And I think maybe a lot of people were hit by that. And Massey is very well known out here in this neck of the woods. This is this is Massey country out here, apparently. And so uh, I think that there was a, a lot of that going on there um, because Mike has historically been very popular in his district. So I'm I'm. I'm interested to see what your thoughts are on how the redistricting affected a lot of that. And, you know, the, the Randy Rudrick's name was thrown around a lot as some of the redistricting things and stuff like that. So what, what is your thoughts on that component? Well, of it? I'm sure redistricting does affect it. And I'm sure it, it is a, a big, a bigger challenge for, for Mike as a result of redistricting. Uh, but, yeah, but it, it's the reality, right? I mean, it is what it is. And, and now that now that you know that redistricting does have that effect, now you know that it brings uh, massive voters uh, into the into the district. Uh, you got to respond to that. And, and and I think I don't think I'm not I'm not, you know, saying that that shower's done or that uh, Holland's done. And and, you know, we, we need to go on to other things. I think what these these races show is that they're in good position. But they've got to work it. Uh, they, they are they are in a competitive position. They're not in a you know in a click bishop. I don't even have to worry about my opponent much anymore. Uh, uh, position. Uh, they're in a very competitive position, and I think you know, yes, redistricting is, has has put Mike at risk. Now he needs to dig in, and now his supporters need to dig in, and 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 respond to that increased competitiveness, and 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 work out work out work out a victory. Same thing with Roger Holland. Now that he knows that that Giesel isn't, you know, isn't isn't automatically off the ballot, isn't automatically, you know, a no vote for a lot of people. That she has the potential to come back. He needs to dig in and he needs to work it. Uh, and he needs to work it hard. He needs to raise, raise funds to be able to uh, to compete in that district. And frankly, I think the governor has a role here. I think the governor needs to weigh in use some of that political capital that, that, you know, he's got as a result of his contributions, as a result of his vote, he needs to weigh in and say, and he, and he needs to say, look, I need a legislature I can work with. And that legislature is not going to include Kathy Giesel. That legislature doesn't include Doug Massey. I need a legislature that has Roger Holland, has Mike Schauer. Um, and to the extent that, that, you know, the analysis is that he, he Smith still has a chance against Gary Stevens, a legislature that includes Heath Smith. I think, I think the governor needs to weigh in and tell voters that obviously support him what it takes, what legislators he needs uh, to be successful. That's something this governor has not done um, to this point. And I think that's been a failing of the governor. You don't, you, you've got, it's not enough just to be governor. You've got to have a legislature that's supportive of you. And and to have a legislative that support legislature that supports well, you, you got, you got to dig it and try to build it. Let's face it, this governor has not even Brad. This governor has not even run. I mean, he's it's it's a stealth campaign. He hasn't done anything. He's got uh, all I see is some web banner ads and some other things. I don't see anything else. He's he uh, apparently just assumes he's going to just breeze into it and it's going to be fine. I don't think he feels like he needs to do anything at this point. That's my that's my impression of it. Well, then you got a question about why the hell is he running? I mean, what, what, what's the outlook for the next four years? He could tell us a lot. He could tell us a lot if he dug in and got behind some of these candidates that will make a difference uh, in the legislature. Now that we know what races are competitive now, now that we know what, what incumbents or challenges or challengers are in position potentially to win, he could tell us a lot by, by digging in and, and getting behind those candidates. Maybe he won't do it, but you know, then then what we got, what we got for the next four years is just sort of mush, right? I mean, we right. have a legislature that's 
has gone in an entirely different direction. The governor is going in his direction. And, and we just have another four years of mush. We sort just sort of get by for the next four years. Well, and, and let's face it, it's not even just that. It's a it's a legislature that is actively opposed to the governor at every step, even if it's a good step, even if it's something that they may philosophically agree with. They may just the antipathy is just so great that they may just, you know, gridlock the whole thing to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at these races and I mean, there were some severe disappointments. I mean, Kathy Geisel coming back um at the level at which she did that was just um i mean that was shocking to me but it does tell us that you know this is where roger holland now needs to light the afterburner and get into it and get it done mike shower a little bit explainable based on some of the redistricting and other things so he's going to have to focus hard on his race which is unfortunate because he was going to focus on some other things like uh, con con and uh and and helping support people like roger and things like that um, so, I mean, this is going to be a real, this is going to be a real goat rope when it's all said and done. Yeah. And, and I think Michael, to go back to the theme we were talking about at the last break, I think the governor has to step in. I mean, I, you and I have, a, have, have expressed disappointment in the governor over, over the years, over the last four years in some of the decisions he's making and, and some of the steps he hasn't, uh, taken. I think, I think, you know, he's, he's explained it as, you know, preserving his political capital and and maintaining his political capital, great. All right, now's the time to use it. You you you've got this lead over Gara and and Walker. Let's let's go through and 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 let's talk about let's talk about the the legislature you need in order to be a strong governor these next four years. Come on, Kathy Geisel is supporting Bill Walker for governor. There's nothing nothing that's going to happen good out of Giesel winning that election. If the governor, I haven't I haven't looked at the governor's numbers in that particular district and that's something I should do. But but if if the if if if, if Dunleavy is going to win this election, he needs to be using he really win the election in terms of not only winning himself but getting a legislature that will that will work with him toward the objectives that he's outlined. If he's going to achieve that, he needs that legislature and he needs to start talking about Kathy Geisel being Bill Walker's candidate for governor, Doug Massey being the union's candidate uh, uh, for uh, uh, for the Senate. He needs to get out there and he needs to invest himself uh, in some of these races. I, we, we, or else, or else, as I say, all the good that's going on, Dunleavy finishing first, Charlie finishing fourth. The Pika, uh, the the oil, uh, the the Repsol and the and the Santos decision on Pika oil prices, ANS oil prices staying up uh, as a result of the Russian. It, it, all of those good things are going to be sort of for naught if we get back to the legislature and we we and the Senate has gone into uh, has gone to a coalition because we know what that means. We know that means PFD cuts, and we know that that the legislature controls the PFD. The governor can't override the legislature's decision on the PFD. So if this governor is really a pro-PFD governor, he needs to get in these in these legislative elections and he needs to support pro pro-PFD candidates. Otherwise, he, it's, it's just talk on his part. He's not doing the things he needs to do to be able to uh, to follow through on uh, protecting the PFD. This is a governor that does not like confrontation. This is a governor that does not like to go out there, it seems to me, this is my opinion, and, you know, get his hands dirty and 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 get out there and meet and greet. We saw that pullback over the last 18 months of the governorship where he just didn't want to interact with the people. He didn't want to engage. Uh, I offered his office every opportunity to come on the program and have a free form uh, idea session. It seemed like every time he wanted to come on, it was nine minutes and he had a very specific thing that he wanted to talk about and that was it. And then we moved on. It was, you know, he just doesn't want to engage the community. And then on top of that, we talked about, again, the redistricting with Shower. Uh, Kevin McCabe just pointed out in the chat room, the new district that Giesel is running in, they don't even know her. Rob, Roger Holland has knocked on many doors and many do not know who Giesel is. Maybe that's to her advantage. It's the same thing we're seeing out in the uh, KGB area where people just don't know who Mike Shower is. Um, so that could play a huge part in this as well. Yeah, exactly right. But but it's got but we know where we got to work now, right? We we know we know what sort of, you know, the effort that's been put in to this point. We know what that produces. 
And we know, we know what it produced in the primary. So we now need to get in there. And, and in terms of Dunleavy doesn't want, doesn't want to engage, Walker's hitting him in the mouth every day. Kathy Geisel's hitting him in the mouth every day. Doug Massey, although he's not saying it, Doug Massey is running as an establishment R, a business R, an anti, a cut to PFD R, uh, uh, and, and is being funded by, by those sources. They're hitting Dunleavy in the mouth every day. It's, it's one thing about not wanting to engage, but it's another thing when, you're, when your opponents are just taking body shots at you and, and you don't do anything in response. You let your allies, like Mike Schauer and, and Roger Holland, you let your allies slowly twist in the wind. That's not what you want a governor to do. You want a governor to get in the mix and, and to support his allies so, his, so he has allies in the legislature when it's time to support them. And I think um, I, I think there's going to be a new level of disappointment in Dunleavy if he doesn't use the political capital that he's built up to help support his his allies uh, uh, that you know that the that the elections identified have challenging races. Right. Well, and and of course, when you start looking at some of the candidates, somebody just said Massey wants the AK Union pensions back. I hear we can't afford that. Yes, we're starting to see more and more of the, uh, you know, this discussion on, you know, defined benefits and tier one and all this other kind of stuff, which from several of these candidates, including Giesel and Massey and more. And that's just, again, it just shows more government programs is the direction that they want to go. More government spend. And more government programs from these people means more PFD cuts. That's, I mean, they're looking at the PFD as, as a slush fund to, uh, to, to, to fund those programs. So, if you let those people, if you let those people win, if you, if you, if this election goes down that road and you get a coalition in the Senate, either body can effectively stop the PFD. If you let, if you get a coalition in the Senate, that's the direction we're going. Yeah. All right, Brad, you want to give us a, a tease for number two, which is, I know the good news on oil for Pika and more. Give us an idea there. Well, there's some great news on, uh, great news on uh, Alaska oil. Uh, coming out uh, the last week, uh, both in terms of the near term and I think in terms of of the longer term, and uh, and I I I want to I want to milk that for all it's worth uh, because we don't get a lot of good news sometimes. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, our guest. Weekly top three. We're on to the Pika thing and the good news for the state of Alaska. Brad, hit us with it. So the the the, the two owners of Pika, uh, Santos, uh, an Australian company, and Repsol. A Spanish company have sanctioned uh, Pika have, have have approved uh, the final investment decision to go forward uh, with with the first phase uh, of the Pika project. Pika was originally a, a, a big, massive uh, project that uh, that uh, when Oil Search was was in charge of it uh, was was trying to do in one bite. Uh, they realized the capital wasn't going to be there. That the that the demand. Uh, it, the capital market uh, uh, fulfillment of, of their demand for money wasn't going to be there, so they they broke it down into pieces. Um, and and Santos and uh, uh, Repsol have sanctioned uh, uh, gone to FID on the first piece of it. That piece is big. It's a uh, investment of something around the neighborhood of 2.6 billion dollars. They're talking about 2,500 uh, jobs uh, uh, during the uh, during the development phase of it. Uh, it uh, results in 80,000 barrels a day, projected to result in 80,000 barrels a day of additional production, production uh, flowing uh, by 2026. All of that is extremely good news for Alaska, the jobs, the additional production. But here is what I think the most important thing is. Uh, the most important thing is somebody's investing in Alaska. Somebody other than ConocoPhillips, somebody other than, a, than an incumbent, somebody new is investing in Alaska oil production on the North Slope. I think that's a big message, an important message. It, it's even it's made even more important by the fact that Oil Search and Santos had been looking uh, had for had been looking for co-investors. They've been looking to sell down their share, uh, sell a portion of it to somebody else, fifteen percent of their share, uh, to somebody else to mitigate the risk. They haven't, they haven't entered into an agreement. They've said they've had a lot of people interested, but they haven't entered into an agreement to sell. But they're nevertheless going ahead. They're nevertheless going ahead on their own bottom, on their own financial capability to, uh, uh, to make this development decision. They may sell down later, but 
but they're going ahead right now. I think that sends a powerful message uh, out there to the to the industry that Alaska is not dead. Alaska is a is a place to uh, continue to to look for additional supplies. It's a place to develop additional supplies, um, and I think coming in advance of what I hope will be the same the FID decision final investment decision for Willow once the BLM uh, acts on, uh, on on the supplemental environmental impact statement. Uh, I think that will send a powerful message that Alaska is still alive and Alaska is moving forward. I got to admit, I didn't, I had had become extremely concerned about whether PICA was going to make, or about whether oil search Santos, I'll get there someday, whether Santos was going to make this decision. Uh, there were a lot of signs indicating the sell down, uh, the delay, um, in the in the FID, um, there were a lot of indications that that raised concerns in my mind. I think I think this decision is uh, is just a huge step forward in terms of maintaining Alaska's uh, profile in the oil industry, and I'm and I'm extremely pleased uh, extremely pleased to see it. Especially in light of all the wokeism that we're seeing, uh, putting pressure against investments and and financial institutions and banks and and every other kind of player out there about keeping Alaska pristine, this is good news in that uh, in that aspect as well. And and these are two uh, sort of mid size, mid major. I mean, it, the oil industry uses a lot of terms, but these are these are not the uh, you know the powerful seven or the powerful five. This, these are sort of two strong companies um, that easily could have made the decision to go someplace else, easily could have been influenced to go someplace else. I mean, they're still dependent on capital yep. markets for the funding. So I, I just think it's a, I think it sends a very powerful message. Well, that's good news for number two. Let's move on to number three, which is this story by Sean McGuire out of the ADN talking about how the budget sur- surplus is shrinking. Uh, initially $128 a barrel back in June, now down to 100, uh, heading downwards towards 80, 89. And uh, that sur- surplus we talked about could be gone. What's your take on it? I, I, there was a, Sean did an article in the ADN. Larry personally did an article in the Alaska Journal of Commerce, both along the same lines, both building from the uh, Department of Revenue's uh, latest projection. Here's my problem. The Department of Revenue is using uh, Brent prices, the forward Brent curve, just Brent itself, uh, as uh, in order to project prices. ANS has been running three to four bucks, two to three to four bucks ahead of Brent, on top of Brent, consistently since the Russian invasion, and there's the Russian invasion of, of, of the Ukraine and, and the and the and the restriction on Russian volumes as a result right, of that. Right. Um, and ANS continues to run ahead of Brent. I think, I think DOR is missing the boat by not including the, the, the ANS premium in its forward look. And as a result, these sorts of doom and gloom articles, uh, I think, overstate the case by, by a significant amount because they're basing it on DOR, who's basing its forecast on Brent. I do when I do my daily analysis of, of forward-looking oil prices. I include the ANS premium uh, in uh, in 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 those numbers. Uh, I include them in my revenue numbers. I include them in my projections. And when you look at those numbers, we're down. We're down from the 101 uh, that uh, that the budget is based on. But we're not down huge amounts. I think the last thing, the last Saturday analysis I did, was we were down two percent on revenues. Uh, from where uh, from where we were projected uh, to be uh, uh, in in the budget, so these articles, I think, as well as DOR, I think, are just way overstating the doom and gloom case. I think, and <laughs> in, in coming from me, I mean, that's a big deal. I mean, right. coming from me, I think, I think, I think the You're picture Mr. is better than what they're painting it. Yeah, you're Mister Doom and Gloom at that point, right? I mean, so what what's the reasoning then? I mean, if if this is the problem. Uh, and it's not as bad as as it, they're making it look out to be. Is this, uh, you know, what there's got to be a reason? What what's well, the reason for this kind? Well, A and S has always has always bounced around Brent, and I think DOR's perspective is that it's conservative. It's safe to continue to just say it's gonna it's gonna even out uh, at the Brent price. But I think the dynamics, the market. Elwood Bremer did a great article on this in the Fairbanks News Miner a few months ago. I think the dynamics in the oil market have changed as a result of the Russian invasion. You can see that on the West Coast. 
Russia used to be a not immaterial part of the West Coast mix. Now it's not there at all. And so the West Coast refineries are having to go out and get additional barrels uh, from someplace else. And, and, I, and I think the dynamics of the market are shifting in a way that's, that's positive for A&S price. I just, DOR is being, to me, is being super conservative by, st- by continuing to, to stick to the Brent price uh, in their forward look. I think that's leading to unnecessarily gloomish uh, uh, revenue projections. And I think that then translates into, into Sean McGuire and Larry Persley articles because they're just picking up on, uh, they're just picking up on, on what DOR is saying. I, uh, we, we, need, we need to account for the ANS premium that's coming out of the Russian invasion. DOR is not doing it yet. And what is what uh, what do you uh, make of this discussion about um, drawing from the uh, CBR, but now from the SBR, but now back to the CBR because the SBR was defunded? What uh, why include that? What 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 is the point you think there in that regard? Well, I think I think it's a you know fear factor. It's it's they're trying to you know stir up the fear that that uh, ultimately it sort of translates into the governor's race, right? We want a governor who's going to be responsive to you know to 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 spending and will find ways to fund that spending uh, as opposed to Governor Dunleavy. Now, I, I will say that, that it concerns me because the, 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 the place they take money out of, the, ta- the place the legislature takes money out of and the governor can't control it, when the legislature is in trouble from a revenue standpoint is the PFD. Right. So there, there, is a, there is a way in which you know, the governor's decision to defund the SBR put that money in the CBR and force a CBR vote, frankly, comes back and haunts the, C, the, the PFD. Uh, but I, but I, I don't think we're at that point of doom and gloom yet. I think that, that we're seeing oil price forecasts that, that don't reflect the market for A&S. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. We're talking about the weekly top three. Um, Brad, final thoughts here as we wrap down. Two minutes left uh, on everything we've seen. Uh, the the, the uh, primary, the PICA, the, uh, the uh, price of oil. Give us your final thoughts here. I think, I think there is, a, I think there is a, 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 if you were just sitting here and just sort of plopped into this moment, I think I think there's a reason to be to be positive um, about Alaska and about Alaska's uh, uh, situation. Not overly you know hilarious about it, but but I think there's a reason to be positive. The Santos decision is a good sign for Alaska. The fact that that voters uh, put Dunleavy first and Charlie uh, Charlie Pierce, sort of a guy coming out of uh, with, with very low name name recognition, fourth. I think that's that's a positive. Um, the fact that I think uh, ANS is 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 has has this premium and continues to demonstrate this premium uh, in terms of what it means for the budget, I think that's a positive. But we need we need to keep those positives flowing. And and the one thing, as I said early, the one thing that really concerns me is the Senate. If we if we lose the Senate, if the Senate goes to a coalition, which if 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 these election results held in the final, that's where the Senate would go. It would go to a coalition. Uh, if the Senate goes to a coalition, I think we can very easily go back into a doom and gloom scenario, particularly for the PFD. So there are a lot of positives, a lot of reason to feel good right now, but we've got to translate that into support for people like Shower and Roger Holland and others to keep the Senate from slip from, from slipping backwards and sending us back into a, into a doom and gloom scenario. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thanks for coming on board and joining us today. We appreciate you uh, being part of it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap on another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.